Good morning, and uh, welcome to St. Paul's. Uh, I would ask if there are any children here uh, to come up to the front with uh, Pat. Join us in the opening hymn, number one.
prayer found on page 67, which we pray together. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts feel, all desires are known, and from whom you seek your salvation, let us pause to our hearts on the consideration of the heart of the Spirit, that we may be perfectly beloved, and are fully married by our Holy Name, to prove our soul. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, I hear of Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us, and the right thing to be done. lesson is written in the book of Jeremiah in the first chapter, beginning at the first verse. 
words of Jeremiah, son of Kukia, of the priests who were in Ananoth, in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of King Josiah, son of Ammon of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. It came also in the days of King Jehoiakim, son of Josiah of Judah, and not until the end of the eleventh year of King Zedekiah, son of Josiah of Judah, until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And I said, Ah, Lord, God, truly, I do not know how to speak. I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a boy. For you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to, to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations, and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy, and to overthrow, to build and to plant. And this is the word of the Lord. The 73rd Psalm. Find it on page 416. Please read along by the song. <clears throat> In thee, O Lord, have I put my trust. Let, Let me never be forced to confusion. Deliver me and rescue me in thy righteousness. For thy great mercy is to Be thou my stronghold, whereunto I may always resort. Deliver me, O my God, out of the hand of the ungodly. Out of the hand of the unrighteous and the wicked. For thou, O Lord, art the thing that I long for. Thou, O Lord, art my trust, even my life. Through thee have I been holding up ever since I was born. Thou art he that is clearly my precious. My praise shall be always unto thee. I am become as it were a wonder unto me. Glory be to the Father and to the 
Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, is now, and it shall be, for all the The second lesson is written in Paul's letter to the Hebrews, beginning at chapter 12, in the 18th verse. You have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice whose words made hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even an animal touches the mountain, he shall be stoned to death. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. For you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, to heavenly Jerusalem and to innumerable angels in pestilence gatherings, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse the one who was speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused the one who warned them on earth, how much less will we escape if we reject the one who warns from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. <coughs> this phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of what is shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks, by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For indeed, our God is a consuming fire. Here ended the lesson. Will you please rise and sing with me the gradual hymn?
Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke. Now Jesus was teaching in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up. When Jesus saw her, he <clears throat> called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader, synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it to give it water? And not not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for eighteen long years, be set free from bondage on this Sabbath day. When Jesus said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that Jesus was doing. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Would you find page 71 in your prayer book and join with me in saying the Creed of our faith? <coughs> O oh Lord, you make eloquent the lips of infants for the goodness of your blessing on our lips. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Excuses. Excuses. We all hear excuses and we all make excuses. If you're like me, you probably remember better the excuses offered to you than you remember the excuses you offer to others. I was a grade 8 boy, and so basically, if you're a grade 8 boy, you should be excusing yourself all the time. I had held a distinction made by one of the few teachers whose words I remember. I don't even remember all their faces. But Mr. Donald Dowden, 
was easily remembered. He was the sort of uh, major general of the English sort in the East End of Toronto, where I went to school at Oak Park Collegiate, a junior high school, um, a grand name for a gritty school um, in the East End with a multitude of international tongues. Well, uh, Mr. Dowden um, heard many excuses, including my own, and uh, he made a, a distinction between reasons and excuses. Reasons, he said, were just reasons. They explained things. Excuses, like long uh, But in his classroom, therefore, um, someone arriving late and saying, I was held up, when questioned might say, well, my mother got me up late, and uh, then I couldn't find my homework. In fact, he hadn't done it, so he had enough time to scrawl a few words on the piece of paper. <clears throat> and then going out the door, his mother told him on her way to work, had he put out the garbage and he hadn't the night before, and so on and so on. Whereas a really good excuse was, Thieves broke into our house as I was leaving, they tied us up, we called the police, and here I am. There is a difference, seriously, between reasons and excuses, but I would like to speak of them in the way we conventionally use them, as things we say or do to get ourselves off the hook. And you know what, there's a lot of excuses in the Bible. I don't know if you've uh, noticed that when you're reading the scriptures, but there are many excuses in, in the Bible. Uh, excuses that we offer to God for doing or not doing things, or saying or not saying things. And of course, we start with Jeremiah, uh, who among our ancestors is remembered for beginning his ministry with excuses. And this story is remembered in some detail, as we have heard from our lecture this morning. Uh, it was not just Jeremiah, but Jeremiah the son of Hilkiah, and Hilkiah was one of the priests that lived at Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, and he offered the word of the Lord uh, during the years of King Josiah, actually the 13th year, so he's not a boy anymore, and during the time of his sons, Jehoiakim and Zedekiah, who in his 11th year it all came to an end. So this was remembered, and as soon as it's remembered, we hear the story of the calling of Jeremiah. The Lord said to Jeremiah, we don't know how he heard it, or in what context, but it was remembered by the community. He heard that he was called to be a prophet to the nations, and that would be enough to make anyone's heart grow cold. To be a prophet to the nations is a hard job. To be a prophet of any kind is incredibly demanding. And the words that the Lord spoke to him, saying, I've known you since your mother's womb, echoing the sentiments of the psalmist, didn't help Jeremiah. And so he began with the big excuse, I'm just a boy, and I don't really know how to speak. And in fact, he probably wasn't a boy, as we usually say, boys are boys. But 13 year old boy in grade 8, but he was probably young. Remember how the leaders looked down on Jesus when they said, You're not even 40 years old. I am too young and I do not know how to speak. And the Lord said to Jeremiah, You will know, and I will tell you what to say. But that is not an excuse. And it turned out not to be an excuse. And the job was big. It was to tear down what was wrong. It was to speak out against what was evil. It was to call judgment on our treatment of each other and our approach to God. And he was also, however, to build and to plant, we're told. So his mandate would end there, but it would take him through a lot of pain to himself. And pain his hearers needed to have inflicted on them before they could smarten up about how they treated each other and how they approached God. So that excuse is embedded in the story of 
of Jeremiah for us to think about and reflect on. It's been passed on in some detail so that when we feel we are called, we will remember Jeremiah's excuse. And whatever we're called to, whatever moment, prophetic moment we're called to, maybe not the life of the prophet, but whatever moment we're called to, we will remember it's not our ego berating the world <coughs> online or offline. It's not ours to make this up. But if we are called to speak the truth, then the truth will tell us. It will hurt. But if we're called, there can be no excuses. Story in the life of the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ, who we just confessed in the Creed, is a different sort of story with a different sort of excuse. In fact, there could have been a first excuse. Let me explain. In the story, Jesus is in the synagogue, in the synagogue on a Sunday, in the synagogue on a Sunday teaching. Nothing wrong with that, even from a critic's point of view. And he sees a woman. And so often people approach Jesus for healing. But Jesus approached her. He saw her bent over, as we heard in the prayer this morning. And yet he said to her, come. And she could have said, come here. She was bent over, but she came. She was unbound. She was set free. And this was extremely annoying to the leader of the synagogue. Religious leaders don't come off well in the scriptures often. Whether they're lay leaders or clerical leaders, it doesn't matter. They don't come off well. The leader of the synagogue had the protocol in mind. He didn't like Jesus. Jesus was interrupted. But sometimes interruptions matter. This woman whose life was interrupted by the glance and the words of Jesus gave up her excuse, whatever it may be, about her ability and came to Jesus. But the leader of the synagogue said, come tomorrow. Come the day after. But don't come today. We've got other things to do. Isn't that the truth about us then? Some other day, some other time, we're busy doing religious things right now. So we can't feel, we can't unbind. The um, epistles of Hebrews, um, at least by the name that it was given, after it was written, um, raises up this amazing contrast between two mountains, Sinai on the one hand and Zion on the other. Same God is the God of Mount Sinai as the God of Zion. But the author of the epistle is calling those gathered as we are gathered here this morning. That's what the church is, simply a gathering of uh, Christians. Gathering, he said, to think about Mount Zion, not about Mount Sinai. Remembering that God has called us from fear, fear of the wrong kind, excuses, that God is too scary, God doesn't make sense, why is there evil in the world if there is a God, why did that happen if God was present? To relieve ourselves of those and to walk towards Zion to the festival of the saints that surround us. The author of Hebrews, as you may notice in chapter 11, painted a picture of the crowds around the community of saints, some of whose lives had been lost, some of whom had suffered. But here we are to join that festival community and praise the God who leads us forward into the reality created by Jesus Christ, who set us free, who set the world free, as Jesus did the paralyzed woman. No excuses that God is too scary. No excuses that God didn't do this or that and we don't understand how, but rather that God the God of Mount Sinai is where we are going. Now, these are hard words if I direct them at myself. They must be hard for you, too. But there is something at the center of this which will set us free. 
Uh, about uh, six years ago, six years ago, um, Margaret Visser, you know Margaret Visser? She wrote a number of books, uh, Rituals of Dinner, uh, Geometry of Love. She gave the CDC Massey Lectures entitled Beyond Fate. Uh, some of them given, one of them given right here at King's College a few years ago. Margaret Visser wrote a book in 2016 called The Gift of Thanks. And toward the end of the book, uh, she recalls, uh, she wasn't there, but she recalls an incident and she doesn't give the time, but I, I think she must be in the 1920s or 30s, when the Times of London, the London Times, um, had a kind of uh, welcome to well-known bloggers. And in those days, bloggers were known as writers. And uh, included among them was um, the writer G.K. Chesterton. You've heard of G.K. Chesterton, maybe. Uh, novelist, uh, essay writer, um, mystery writer of Father Brown and stories. Um, and so on. And, and so the question that was put to all these writers in Britain between the wars uh, was the question, what's wrong with the world? And I'm pretty sure G.K. Chesterton's response was the shortest. So in response to the question, what's wrong with the world, these are the exact words he wrote. Dear sirs, comma, I am, comma, yours truly, comma, G.K. Chesterton. What's wrong with the world? I am. We are. No deflecting, no excuses. We are. What stops? We're offered by Jesus Christ, who liberated us, whose story is told by the glass around this church, to be called to liberate others. And there are a hundred ways for that should happen. So let's hear the voice of God. Let's call out ourselves on our own excuses first. Let's reason, let's think carefully. Let's not find ourselves doing something rash, but let's find ourselves doing what we should do. Because God is waiting for us. And the community of saints is waiting for us. And right now, we're to enter into that festal praise around the Lord's table, thinking, that, in a way, it's right to say we are without excuse. May the words of invitation to confession this morning uh, rise in our minds both the truth of what we've been and what we've done and the astonishing forgiveness in Jesus Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Let's rise and sing together the Offertory Hymn, 505 in the Big Blue Hymn.
together the words of thanksgiving on page 74. Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, forever and ever. All that is in heaven and the earth is thine. All things come to thee, and as I know, and give thee. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. 